Hi, my name is Dr. Stan Hazen. We just finished a web chat describing and answering questions about preventive cardiology, and we had many interesting questions, and I thought I'd go over some of those uh, answers for those of you who are listening to this. So one of the questions that was asked is, when should someone go to a preventive cardiology clinic? And the truth is, is that um, can happen in any middle-aged individual, for example, to get an idea about what their global cardiac risk is. But the answer also could be different for someone who has a strong family history of heart disease or known risk factors for heart disease. We often will see patients at a much earlier age or a younger age um, wherein uh, they have a strong uh, history of heart attack, stroke, or even sudden death in the family. And it's very common for, um, unfortunately, for someone to have uh, a serious illness or death in the family that's cardiac in, in uh, nature, and then multiple family members, brothers, sisters, and even sometimes the kids uh, who might be college age will come on in and be evaluated to see whether or not they are at increased risk than uh, might otherwise be expected, for example, by traditional risk factors. What do we do in a preventive clinic? We actually try to globally assess a person's risk. That means looking at multiple things, but we focus on um, the lipid levels, such as cholesterol and triglycerides. We focus on nutrition efforts and diet, which plays an important role in a person's cardiovascular health. We also focus on exercise programs um, because we see that these, and others have seen that these can play a significant role in a person's overall cardiovascular health. But we actually look at many things, blood pressure control, smoking cessation, uh, we call it cardiovascular behavioral health for people who have uh, issues with anxiety or depression or just recently were diagnosed with heart disease uh, and are are depressed, we will actually help them see whether it be a psychologist or a psychiatrist. Um, and so we do a whole array of programs, including weight reduction programs and, and others, to try to globally reduce their cardiac risk. And what we will also focus on is trying to individualize or tailor the, the program for each subject. So in one individual, it may include concerns about sleep and needing to get sleep study and working worries about sleep apnea. Another person, uh, it might actually be focused more on blood pressure control. But in everyone, we try to touch on each of the major risk factors and potential contributors to cardiac risk and to get the, the help that's needed, if it is needed, in terms of other healthcare providers to more globally help to prevent either the development of heart disease or the progression of existing heart disease. About a third to a half of the patients who we see in our program have no known heart disease. Um, and the majority, though, have existing or documented heart disease. Another uh, question that was asked had to do with what kind of tests do we order in preventive cardiology clinic. And we do the routine ones, such as a fasting lipid profile or basic metabolic panel that looks at kidney function and electrolytes and fasting glucose and looks for issues related to diabetes. But we also will look at more specialized tests to help identify people who are at heightened risk for developing cardiac disease or progression of their cardiac disease, such as various markers of inflammation. One of the tests that we will also look at especially at least once, is something called a lipoprotein A, or LP little a. This is a test that is actually linked to premature development of heart disease. It often runs in families, so people who have a family, strong family history of heart disease, we're always thinking about looking for an elevated LP little a when we see that. We focus on globally more aggressive risk reduction efforts, and we actually move the goalposts to more aggressive goals than might otherwise be recommended by typical national guidelines. We also, when we see that level is elevated, will focus on not only risk reduction in the patient we're seeing, but we also make some recommendations about screening for uh, heart disease risks in first degree family members, so siblings and even children, to help identify those that are at heightened risk for the development of cardiac disease who might otherwise not have been recognized by traditional risk factors. 
Another test that was asked about is a calcium score. When do we use it? How do we interpret it? First, what is a calcium score? It is a radiologic or radiographic test that actually measures calcification and the degree of that in the coronary vascular bed. Um, a high level of calcium score uh, does indicate a heightened risk for cardiac disease. What we have to realize, though, is that an elevated calcium or a low calcium score does not exclude the possibility of having cardiac disease. That's because calcification of the vessels is a very late stage of the atherosclerotic process. And it can actually be seen as more of a, a healing over or a scarring of the atherosclerotic plaque. The calcified plaque is a more stable form of atherosclerosis than the non-calcified lipid rich and inflamed plaque. And so um, if someone has an elevated calcium score, that is a score over 100, that suggests increased risk and we kind of move to more aggressive preventive efforts. We do not get serial calcium scores once you have a positive calcium score. You can think of a calcium score as being like a pregnancy test. Once it's positive, testing it and getting more information to see is it even more positive is not helpful. Uh, it has no prognostic value, the interval change in calcium score once it's positive. Um, and so uh, we don't use the calcium score routinely in everyone, but we do sometimes as an adjunct to helping to identify who is at increased risk amongst primary prevention patients, especially where we haven't other reason to think that they're at increased risk. And uh, other tests are normal, and if the subject is still really concerned, we sometimes can go ahead and get a calcium score to see our, is there any other you know, reason to think a person's at risk we might otherwise not be recognizing. One of the tests that we sometimes will perform is something called TMAO, stands for trimethylamine and oxide. This is a metabolite that's made by gut microbes. It actually is a very strong predictor of the development of heart disease and for thrombotic events like heart attack and stroke. It also tracks with mortality risk quite well. Elevated levels of TMAO are linked to not only cardiac risk, but they also tend to go up depending upon what a person eats. And that's because this compound is made by the metabolism of nutrients that are abundant in animal products, and in particular, red meat. A very recent study that just came out uh, from our group showed that individuals who eat a diet that is rich in red meat for the protein source can have a TMAO level that's uh, on average threefold higher than if they were to switch their diet to the protein source coming from white meat or non-meat uh, sources of protein, such as vegetables. And so um, if a person has a high TMAO, what do we do? We recommend more global preventive risk-reducing efforts. We lower things like LDL goal. Because it's associated with platelet stickiness and clotting risk, we uh, look to see whether or not addition of low-dose aspirin to their regimen will be helpful and make sure that there are no clear contraindications, though, before starting a low-dose aspirin. And the other thing is, is we look to their diet and see whether or not some changes in the diet might be beneficial in helping to reduce TMAO levels. And just like one can follow a cholesterol level or a triglyceride level or a glucose level with dietary changes and help to tailor a person's diet, you can also follow uh, TMAO levels with diet changes. And recent studies have shown that when one switches from a, a predominantly red meat diet to, as I mentioned, a white meat or non-meat protein source diet, within a month, the TMAO levels will come down on average threefold in most subjects. And so uh, it is a uh, addressable or intervenable uh, risk factor. Uh, another question that was asked um, was, uh, are there any other uh, tests that we perform, like do we do, uh, what tests do we routinely do and do we do stress tests in patients uh, who are seen in preventive cardiology? And the answer is uh, it really depends on the patient's history, their risks, and their symptoms. We don't routinely, for example, get stress tests in every single patient, but if the symptoms suggest that there may be a concern or an issue, then we go ahead and get an exercise stress test. 
Oftentimes what we will do for a high risk patient is also do an exercise stress test as part of our development of the exercise program to actually evaluate what is a safe amount for them and whether or not it is safe for a higher risk patient to be doing the type of exercise program that we want. And lastly, like you may be asking, and one of the questions that was asked is how much exercise? And um, on average, what we recommend is that someone do for a, a three to five days of sustained cardio-based type of exercise per week. And that each session should be anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes, and it can be just simply walking at a brisk pace. But it can be anything that's comparable to that level of activity. So whether one wants to hike or bike or swim or Pilates or jazzercise, there are questions about yoga. I will say that you want to have the amount of effort that is comparable to a brisk walk. So walking on a treadmill, that would be walking at a three to three and a half mile per hour pace continuously without stops for a 30 to 45 minute period. And whatever the choice of exercise is, uh, that is comparable to that is really all that is needed. As patients tend to get up in age, we also sometimes then start suggesting addition of weightlifting or things to help tone and maintain muscle mass and fitness. Uh, but that is not really a cardio benefit. That's really maintaining vitality and, and just strength uh, issues. Um, and from a cardio standpoint, it's, it's getting the heart rate up and and doing a continuous level of exercise. That tended to be the, the topics that we covered during the web chat, and um, if you have any questions or concerns, we're welcome to seeing you in the Preventive Cardiology Program here at the Cleveland Clinic.